now want to introduce Rune Gravlund. Rune is an associate professor, professor at SDU from the Department of the Study of Culture and the Department of Literature. And I want to introduce him by his own description for this talk because I think it kind of says everything. The talk will examine visions of ruined porn and the post-apocalyptic sublime as presented through fiction, film, television, photography and computer games in order to question the role beauty plays in aestheticizing collapse brought on uh, by Anthropocene ex uh, excesses. And I just found that really like blew my brain. So I'm very much looking forward to hear more. Welcome very much. Thank you very much. You can hear me? Yes, good. Right. Okay. Um, so I won't be I won't be actually talking much about computer games because that's when I wrote it, but um, I, I will mention it uh, shortly. But so what I'll be doing first of all is basically to try and deconstruct this idea of, of beauty and aesthetics combined. Because when I was um, approached by the organizers uh, asking me to relate to this question, I thought really that there are two questions that we need to, to engage with here. Um, first of all, how, if at all, can aesthetics contribute to sustainable design and living? But also, how do we define beauty? and can uh, beauty contribute to sustainable design and living? And I think it's important to sort of split this original question into two, um, in that our perception of what beauty is and is not is, of course, first of all, subjective, um, something we can go back to later on. And secondly, that aesthetics is a much wider term than beauty. Um, I'm, traditionally speaking, um, aesthetics has been closely connected with beauty, but I think our contemporary use of aesthetics span other sensations as well. Uh, not least that which is ugly, unpleasant, uncomfortable, broken, and blemished. So what I'll be doing over the next 15 minutes is to sort of trace a trajectory that goes from beauty uh, as it was traditionally conceived, which is as harmony, as perfection, and a balance, uh, onto the aesthetics of a world that is broken, imperfect, imbalanced, and quite unsustainable. Um, some examples of this would be, for instance, as we see down here, Henderson Island, which is situated in the South Pacific, which is an uninhabited island, remote from any human habitation, and yet the beaches look like this. Uh, we have the oceans themselves, which you see up here on the right, uh, filling up with plastics, some estimates saying that in 30 years' time there will be more plastics in the sea than fish. Uh, we have Mount Everest, first ever climbed by humans in 1953. This is what it looked like last summer when a lot of wealthy people were sort of waiting to queue up there to get their, uh, like tourists at the Mona Lisa, to get their selfie on top and then falling off and dying after that. But anyway. And then, of course, we have the climate itself, which we all know where it's heading, right? So nature, therefore, is no longer nature as we once thought of it. And from this, it also follows that um, natural beauty as we once conceived it, the sort of the sublime of the inviolate mountain peak, or the untouched primal nature of the Amazon or the great woods of the Pacific, all that must be seen in a different light as well. But to go down this sort of route of decay and despair and disruption may seem to be working at cross-purposes to what I've been asked to do here, given my brief, namely to answer again how aesthetics and beauty can contribute to sustainable design and living. But I do think it's important to break down this notion of beauty, uh, first of all, in order to approach it from a new and perhaps less pleasing angle before we can sort of start to really engage with, with the, the overall question in a satisfactory manner. So, starting out with this book, Ecocritical Aesthetics, Language, Beauty and the Environment, uh, edited by Peter Quickly and Scott Slovic, a fairly recent book, uh, they ask uh, early in the book, where has the interest in the study of beauty gone in ecocritical studies? And just very quickly, for those of you who don't know what ecocritical studies is, it is basically criticism of literature uh, with a focus on ecology, but it had then sort of expanded to be more than that, it goes on to philosophy, art, film, and so on. Now, tracing the beginnings of first wave ecocriticism in the 80s and 90s onto the second and third wave of ecocriticism of the 21st century, Quigley and Scott's uh, and, and Slovak's initial conclusion is uh, that, that beauty often feels private, it feels complacent, and also that the word beauty is a little bit embarrassing. There is something sort of old fashioned about it. Um, they, they go on to sort of examine the 20th century and saying that modernism, first of all, and then postmodernism was, as they put it, pretty hard on the concept of beauty. And certainly, I mean, if we look at the postmodernists with their ironic stance, uh, they find it very, very difficult and somewhat embarrassing to deal with the earnestness that, that sort of is implicit uh, in, in an appreciation of beauty. 
But as pointed out by Scott and Slovic, um, there was in fact a time in the 80s and 90s in which um, eco-critical scholars in, for instance, literary studies, attempted to return to an appreciation of beauty, much in the sense that the romantic of the early 19th century had appreciated nature. And here, of course, we have a romantic like Keats um, sitting here enjoying the beauty of listening to a nightingale in a nice pastoral setting. But this return to beauty in first wave eco-criticism proved fairly short-lived. Um, soon we had... Um, so we had, the, first of all, the eco-critics, uh, first wave eco-critics that were quite fond of nature writing uh, of the past, but they were sort of subsumed by second wave eco-critical concerns of how to live in the actual world of the present, rather than this pastoral, bucolic retreat of the past that no longer exists. So beauty, again, sort of cast aside after sort of a short um, uh, spot, uh, in the spotlight again. Uh, it was viewed as reactionary, as backwards-looking, as unrealistic, as, and also as somehow otherworldly. It didn't really quite deal with the world as it was. Uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, for instance, if you know that, would be sort of a classic of, of second-wave eco-criticism. It, it's dealing with um, industrialization and pesticides, and the, the silent death of, of all life, and in particular birds. So as opposed to Keats' Nightingale here, there's not a single nightingale left in, in Carson's book. They're all dead. Uh, and then we move to third-wave eco-criticism, where a couple of sort of the classics here, prismatic ecology, eco-theory beyond green, uh, philosophy and ecology after the end of the world, dark ecology, uh, after, uh, um, ecology about nature, many titles like that, basically about endings, all of it. So what then would be some examples of an aesthetics that question our ideas of beauty, uh, of nature and sustainability? Uh, sort of an aesthetics that go beyond green, into the future, after the world as we once knew it, has ended. Now, one of the most sort of familiar aesthetic responses to the potential collapse of an unsustainable way of life is seen in pop culture. In, for instance, Hollywood uh, apocalyptic film. Uh, in films like these, we see this sort of vision of, of what some critics have called the apocalyptic sublime, in which all that which humankind has created, cities, technology, civilization, and so on, is sort of pummeled by a number of violent and ugly events beyond our control. We have hurricanes, earthquakes, firestorms, blizzards, tsunamis, um, as well as giant monsters like Godzilla here, who in the latest of now 35 films of Godzilla films have been sort of woken up by Mother Earth in order to wipe out the locust plague of the human race. This is the, I can't remember it came out this year, last year. Uh, it's a very sort of eco-critical film, in a bad Hollywood way, of course. A less spectacular, uh, but also reminiscent trend of aestheticized beauty through collapse is that of ruins photography, or as it's also called, ruined porn. Um, got some examples of it here. Now, um, ruined porn is problematic for many reasons. Um, uh, for instance, in the case we have New Orleans up here and in Detroit, was sort of some classic examples of it. Uh, and notice sort of how there's sort of, there are no sort of actual people in these images. I mean, these are cities in which people actually live. I have millions of people live there. That's one of the problems of ruined porn. I take the opposite uh, example, that of Chernobyl, and the sort of a town quite next, close to it called Pripyat, recently dramatized in the TV series Chernobyl, which some of you might have seen. Uh, we have here, we have the so-called exclusion zone, which is unfit for human habitations for hundreds, if not thousands of years to come. Uh, and the draw of these places, both for photographers aestheticizing human misery, but as well as tourists going there uh, through this um, notion of dark tourism, is of course questionable, and since we're talking about beauty, it is also to some extent in bad taste. Still, what I want to ask here, and my, what I have, like, eight minutes left, what does our fascination with post apocalyptic vision of a world gone wrong, as well as these other aesthetic visions of collapse and unsustainable systems, tell us? Because, I mean, in practice, I don't think any of us, apart from a few preppers, perhaps, really want to live in, in ruins like this. Uh, we certainly don't want to live, I think, in a world... Oh, I haven't got it here, sorry. Um, in a world like Mad Max Fury Road, if any of you have seen that. It's a beautiful film, but I'm sure we wouldn't really want to be driving around the desert uh, being uh, chased by mutants and so on, uh, even though it, it has a draw. Um, but I might ask ourselves again, what are these sort of often quite beautiful visions, but of a broken world, what can they help us achieve? Well, first of all, as a thought experiment, um, allow us to think through these sort of worst-case scenarios of a world gone wrong. So as the Guardian's George Monbiot commented after he'd read Comrade McCarthy's uh, post apocalyptic uh, novel, The Road, there is something to be gained from aesthetic cultural products like novels that news reports, science, and politics simply cannot provide. Um, I thought it had it in here, but I'll just uh, read it here from my screen. This is what, what Monbiot had to say after having read Comer uh, McCarthy's The Road. A few weeks ago, I read what I believe is the most important environmental book ever written. 
It is not Silent Spring, Small is Beautiful, or even Walden. It contains no graphs, no tables, no facts, figures, warnings, predictions, or even arguments. Nor does it carry a single dreary sentence, which, sadly, distinguishes it from most environmental literature. It is a novel, first published a year ago, and it will change the way you view the world. So what he's saying here is that Cormac Harley's novel, uh, The Road, it is exciting, it is also disturbing. Um, it is ugly, it is also beauty. But he's saying like, it doesn't contain a single graph, a single fact. It is simply a thought experiment. What would happen in a world without a biosphere? What would happen, for instance, if, um, if, if we sort of lose our climate? It doesn't, the book actually doesn't talk about climate, but, but he's saying it, it is still one of the most important books he's ever read about the climate, uh, to his mind. What would it do to us? What would it do to our sense of beauty? What would it do to our sense of self? Something perhaps we can talk about in the Q&A. We've got on to talk about what, what, what uh, Ida mentioned here before. Um, but also what's interesting here is what makes McCarthy's The Road bearable to read? Because, I mean, the subject matter itself is intensely depressing about a man and a boy uh, going into a brutally ugly world, um, basically dying as they move ever further down the road. But the thing here is that McCarthy's book is actually quite beautiful. Well, the first time I read it, I uh, sat down in one sitting and I couldn't let it go. It is also a fairly short novel. I do recommend it. Uh, but also saying that it gripped me because it was exciting. It was excitingly awful. Uh, but the reading experience of it also made me sort of ecstatic, simply because as a work of art, it was really, as an aesthetic expression, it was really well-crafted. It was a beautiful book. So, first of all, as a thought experiment, this is how it can help us, aestheticizing beauty like this in a, in a broken setting. Second, I think these visions of a broken world and ugly aesthetics, if you will, can also help us in that it can make us reconsider our notions of beauty. It can make us sort of cherish that which we already consider beautiful and worth saving, that which we think should be sustained, as in first wave eco-criticism, where the sort of more traditional concept of nature as one once knew it, we're, we're trying, to, they're trying to sustain that. But it can also open up perspectives on that, all that which we consider not to be beautiful, and for far too long have considered to be unimportant. Because as the third wave eco-critics have taught us, to live sustainably in the world, it is important to recognize all aspects of it, including that which is less savory, ugly, and even disgusting. And as Timothy Morton says in his um, Ecology Without Nature, the ecological thought, the thinking of interconnectedness, has a dark side embodied not in a hippie aesthetic of life over death or a sadistic sentimental bambification of sentient beings, but in a goth assertion of the contingent and necessarily queer idea that we want to stay with a dying world, a dark ecology. And it is, therefore, I'll sort of end up with a short clip here. Um, it is, as in David Lynch's um, Blue Velvet, a question of not considering... Let's make sure it's actually running. It isn't, yes. Uh, a question of considering not just the manicured white picket, the lawn and the good life, but also that which comes after, and is in fact all around us all the time, even if we prefer not to see and acknowledge it. So, final minute and a half, I'll give over to David Lynch. Should I do Can I? Anyway, it's not that loud. It's a tiny bit better with out of music, but you know, to it so.
So on that notion of a, d a dark ecology and an ugly aesthetics, I'm going to conclude my talk. <laughs>